Luke chapter number 16. Begin reading verse number 10. The Bible says, He that is faithful in that which is the least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, which were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Now Jesus, if you're here for a couple chapters here in the book of Luke, Jesus is on quite a run of parables and illustrations and lessons that are very common even in secular society. Okay, chapter before this, we get the prodigal son. Right after this, we get the certain rich man, right? Lazarus. Okay, very important, right? very powerful illustrations that Jesus has given. But here in the middle, okay, Jesus had, at the beginning of this, talks about the unjust steward. Then, which is a little uncommon, Jesus begins to elaborate on what that story was about. A lot of times Jesus would give a parable and then he would let it sit. And it usually wasn't until he and his disciples had gone away and his disciples would ask, Lord, what do you mean by that? That he would start to explain the parable to them. They understood the earthly story. They didn't understand the hidden heavenly meaning. There were things that they missed. Well, on this occasion... Jesus felt led of the Spirit to do a little bit of explaining after the parable of the unjust steward. We're only looking at part of it. But in verse number 10, it begins with faithfulness. He says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Verse number 11, he says, If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? Then in verse number 12, if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's. Okay, he talks about that which is least. Then he talks about the worldly mammon, meaning the affairs of mankind. And then he says that which belongs to somebody else. And in all three instances, he says, if you're not faithful in those things, right, in this day and age, even into modern day and age people are very good at not being faithful with things that they don't care about that's human nature if it's not important to you you're not going to take care of it if you don't think there's a purpose behind it you'll let it fall by the wayside if you don't believe that your time is being used effectively you're going to abandon what you think is a waste of time and invest your time someplace where you think that it is being used valuably that's just how human nature is. You can white knuckle it for a little bit. Okay, but Jesus said in verse number 13, no man can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He says you can white knuckle it for a little bit, but eventually your heart's going to make its decision. You're going to start to hate one. You're going to start clinging to one. He says, then you're going to start despising the other. You're going to get to the point where every mention of it, that it makes your flesh or it makes your spirit, one or the other, feel ill at the very mention of it. Okay, well, verse number 10 again. He says, he is faithful in the least, is faithful also in much. It is a true principle and that's why when people get hired at companies, they don't hire them as the CEO and then demote them to the more important positions. Okay? The reason that the people at the top of the company get paid more 
It's not just because they've done their duty. They're expected to do more work. People don't understand that apparently nowadays. Right? They want a corner office and they want all of the benefits that come along with it and they don't want to invest anything and they want to do less than anybody else. There's just a slight problem with that. Nobody's going to trust you. Well, let me put it this way. problem with that is nobody in their right mind is going to trust you with a corner office if you've got nothing invested in it. You have to prove yourself a pattern of good works as the New Testament would later say. Right? You as a Christian should have a pattern of faithfulness as a part of your daily life. Not just faithfulness to God, because the Bible teaches us that we're to do all things as unto God. That means you're to be as faithful on the job as you are to Christ, because Christ is the one that entrusted you with that job. That means that when the police officer pulls you over, you don't argue with him, you fess up to what you did. Right, that went over real popular. Does that is the Bible teach that we're to give heed to those that have the rule over us? That we're supposed to show respect unto principalities? Well, you know what principalities were back then, and now they're, they're the law keepers. Right? When you go through a doorway, right, I just believe that if you'd hold the door open for Jesus, you should hold it open for somebody else. That's just called being decent. But your life should be a pattern of of Christ-like attributes, one of which was faithfulness. Christ was, in the Old Testament, prophesied, and in the New Testament came and fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law. You know what that means? He was faithful down to the very minute details. He didn't miss a single part of it, because if he had, our salvation wouldn't be whole, wouldn't be complete. He fulfilled all the laws so that he could forgive all sin. And make the payment for all sin. But we likewise should be faithful, regardless of what it was. Here's how faithful Christ is. Anybody here know what a reed is? It's a dried piece of grass. And at the Hall of Praetorium, where some less than uh, nice guys, okay? named centurions are about ready to scourge him. That means they're trying to beat a confession out of him. The Bible talks about how they hit him with the cat of nine tails. The Jews wouldn't give anybody more than 39 stripes, but the Romans, they didn't have a limit. It says that they plucked the beard from his face. It's where they planted that crown of thorns on the top of his head. It's where they buffeted him while he was wearing a blindfold and they would tempt him by saying prophesy who it was that hit you. Right? By the time he was done at the Hall of Praetorium, that's what he looked like when they nailed him to the cross. So when Isaiah testified many, many moons before that and prophesied said that his visage was marred much more than a man, that's what he looked like after them centurions got done with him. And then he carried a cross two miles up the Via Della Rosa after being subjected to that refusing help along the way right, well here's how faithful Jesus is as them centurions are beating him they give him a reed as a mock symbol of like a staff okay, or a ruler's scepter I don't know about you I played a little bit of football when I get hit, I tense up. That's just a natural reaction. Okay? If somebody, God forbid, were to walk up here right now and punch me in the face, first off, they'd be on the floor a little bit after that. But if they did, my body's reaction is to tense up. They handed him a dried piece of grass. You know how easy it is? Take a dried piece of grass and it to crumble in your hand. It says that they took it back from him after they had scourged him. That means that the entire time they beat him, he kept it safe in his hand against what was going on from everywhere else around him. He made sure that the cat and nine tails never clipped it. He made sure that when they hit him, the reed was out of harm's way. 
He was faithful in the smallest details. Because how could he say, cast all your cares upon him that cares for you, unless he could demonstrate that even the things that you think aren't important, like a dried piece of grass, if you commit it unto him, he promised that he would return it to you in like manner, that he would keep it safe. That what's important to you is important to him. That's how faithful Christ was. That's what's expected of us. Christians didn't get to name Christians because they got a committee together and decided that's what their name was going to be. They were called Christians first at Antioch. Why? Because they were Christ-like. And they meant it as an insult. Oh, you hang out with them fellas, you're going to get crucified too. But yet they took it as a compliment. Why? Because it identified them with the one who had done everything for them. They said it is an honor to be even mentioned in the same sentence as Christ. That's the group of people that considered it a badge of honor to even receive crucifixion. And when they did, most of the time they refused to be crucified on a cross hanging like his. St. Andrew said, Bury me at an, or crucify me at an angle. I don't deserve to be crucified in the same manner as Christ. Others would ask to be crucified upside down or flat on the ground. Why is that? They said he was more faithful. We were faithful in small things. He was faithful in great things. But here, by promise of Christ, a little bit of wisdom from heaven for you. If you're faithful in the small things, then you can be trusted with great things. Why? Because if you don't care about the small details, it doesn't matter how big of a project you get. If you don't care about the small details from the beginning, then the whole project's going to go down the drain. Because you're going to miss something. Or you're going to think something that's not important that ends up being important. It's real easy to teach somebody from the ground up. Real hard to teach from the top down. When you start at the least, you can see from the inside all the layers that get added on the outside to make something truly what it appears to be. But I love the illustration of Charles Spurgeon as a pastor. He had that massive church building in London. Right, he's giving a tour one day and he says, hey, you want to see what heats this place? They think they're going to go see an oil or charcoal furnace. Something that keeps the building heated. No, and he goes and shows them a prayer room. Right, everybody else is thinking, oh wow, how in the world does this place run? They didn't care about the heat. They didn't care about, they didn't have the air back then. But they didn't care about if the windows opened all the way and they got a breeze. Their church members would stay home so that there were more pews open for visitors to come throughout the week. They cared about the little things, as other people would say. Nothing happens without prayer. You say, well, you think that prayer makes all the difference? Prayer's always made all the difference. It's the first step of showing that your faith is truly vested in God, not yourself. How did you get saved? You had to pray. You had to ask the Lord to save you. That was a form of prayer. Right? If it was there at the beginning, pretty important. But he says, two, take the illustration one step further. If you're not praying, if you're not reading your Bible every day, if you're not doing the least things, why would God ever entrust you with something greater than that? That's the bare minimum. Those are the things that are supposed to be joyous unto us. Right? Talking to God, getting in the Word and having Him talk back to us, getting a fresh breath of air from heaven. Right? When was the last time you had to bribe somebody to take a bottle of water when they were running a race? It's refreshing to them. When was the last time you had to tell somebody how good it is for them to take medicine that's prescribed to them? Right? Well, some of us are pretty stubborn. I, I could see that one. Like Brother Bob. Brother Bob's probably a prime candidate for Doctor said, take this. And Brother Bob said, I think I'll be okay. Now that I think about it, I can see that. Right, but those things are just common sense to a new Christian. So why isn't it common sense to somebody that's been a Christian for a while? I'll tell you. Verse number 11. 
If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon. Okay, to go back to the story of the unjust steward. He went out and dealt with the mammon of the master's house every day. Meaning, interactions with the world. And what he did was he went out and tried to please mammon, meaning the flesh. So that after his master fired him, he might have a place where he can go get job number two. Okay, well, by contrast, verse number 11, he says, If ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? What are those? Those are things that have eternal repercussions. Those are deeds that make an impact in the kingdom of heaven. You realize that reading and studying your Bible isn't for God and it's not for anybody else, it's for you? That's the bare necessities. Amen. Right, things that I tried to tell our teens. Reading your Bible, praying, every, that's like waking up and taking a shower and brushing your teeth. Those are things that you have to do if you want to get anywhere in the world. Right, that's getting up and making sure that you put shoes on instead of walking out the door barefoot. Right, it's no wonder that the Apostle Paul gave the analogy of the whole armor of God. That's just making sure you've got on what you need to go get work done. Right, you can ask Brother Eddie. I know this for a fact. If he shows up for work and he's got shoes on that don't have a safety toe in it, if something falls and hurts his foot, it's not the company's fault because they offer to give him however much money a year to go out and buy a pair of shoes that have a safety toe in it. They say, we gave you just didn't put it on. You didn't pursue it. We gave you every opportunity. Maybe he says, if you're unjust with the worldly things, if you're not faithful on the job, even if you're here every time the doors are open, you think that God's going to reward that behavior? You think he's going to take somebody that's unfaithful with things of the world and entrust them with things of God? I don't think so. Verse number 11 is talking about the duality or the duplicity of man. You guys remember Thomas? Oftentimes they call him Doubting Thomas. But the apostle, he had another name. You know what that name was? It was Didymus. That was his nickname. You know what that meant? It meant double-hearted. His nickname was, that guy's a flip-flopper. Right, anybody remember John Kerry? When they called him the flip-flopper when he ran for president against Bush? Right, that's not a good thing to call somebody. But Thomas was known for being all in and then being all out. For being on fire and then being doused with water. That was his personality. So much so that they gave him the nickname for it. Right, you know why they called Christian hog jaws during the police academy? Because he eats bacon and he's got a huge neck. That's why. Okay? Eats more bacon than anybody I've ever seen. It's okay, I'm fatter than you are. I can make that joke. But I got sidetracked. Right? They don't call people things. One, they call them that to kind of jab at them, like, hey, stop doing that and we'll stop calling you this. Okay? The other reason that they called him that was because he had earned that reputation. Okay? It wasn't an oxymoron where they were like, oh, yeah, we call him double hearted because he's the most faithful. No. That's not how that works. If anybody wanted to know who was most, there was no doubt about it. They're all going around the Last Supper saying, Lord, is it I that's going to betray him? And then finally Peter says, John, you ask him, because we know that he'll tell you. He said, he doesn't say, Lord, is it I? He says, Lord, who is it? Everybody knew John was the one that was closest to the Lord. They said, you ask him, we might get an answer. Well, he said, Thomas had the reputation of being double. It didn't surprise anybody. When they came to tell him and he said, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. That's what he said. Which to your flesh makes a whole lot of sense. In truth, John and Peter didn't take it on the report alone. They ran down to the tomb to see that the tomb was empty. 
But even then, seeing that the tomb was empty, Thomas, that wasn't enough for him. He had to see him in the flesh, he said. He had to be able to see that the marks were still in his body. If you're not faithful, if you're double-hearted in everyday matters, why do you think that God would give you anything to do for the kingdom of heaven? You can try, but God's not going to bless it. You can do all the labor in the flesh, but it doesn't mean that God's going to allow it to prosper. There's a whole lot of people that launch out and say, well, I'm going to do this for God. Well, good luck, because unless God does it for you, it ain't going to get done. You can try all you want to, but nothing is going to be built up and last and have any impact for all of eternity unless God ordained it, God sanctioned it, and God birthed it. That's why we believe that around here nothing should be done outside of the local church. Shouldn't be any independent ministries or outreach. Why? Because if it's God sanctioned, it's going to come through the church that God started. He says, if you're unfaithful with the mammon, if you can't even get along with those that you see each and every day, you know all about them, you have sight, you've, you can hear what they say, Right? If you can't find a reason to get a burden for your next door neighbor, why would God entrust you to get a burden for somebody halfway across the world? If you can't just let your light shine where you are, what makes you think that God's going to let you be a lighthouse for a whole other community? If the car don't run, why would you load it up and try to take it on vacation? That's what God's saying in verse number 11. He says, Who will commit to your trust the true riches? You know why the master had this servant, this steward? Because the master had more important things to do than deal with all of these guys. He said, I'm going to give you this so that I can tend to the things that I consider true riches. Well, here's the thing. Christ gave everything that he had to not buy the true riches of the world, he bought the offscour of the world. And he promised us that he would turn us into vessels of honor. So that when he used us for his honor and glory, that he would be magnified. You know who God thinks the true riches are? You. And the lost sinners that are out in the world. Not because of what you were when he saved you or what they are now, but because of what he knows he can make you into. He sees the finished product. He sees us over at the marriage supper of the Lamb where we've received the body like his, where we've already gone to the judgment seat of Christ and given account of those things that we did in our body after we got saved. Right? All of that has been committed to the books. Now it's only all of eternity. He sees us rolling and reigning with Him. He sees us as the joint heirs that He promised we would be. If you can't see the riches in doing the things that may not be enjoyable, not going to lie to you, don't particularly enjoy it when I open the Bible and the Holy Ghost says, today is the day that we're going to give Jordan some conviction. That's not always the most enjoyable thing in the world. You know why I embrace it? Because if I don't embrace the conviction, let it turn into confession, then I'm never going to get any joy out of the Bible till I address it. There's not going to be any encouragement from the Word of God. You know what it's going to be? Doesn't matter where I turn, doesn't matter what I'm trying to read after, all I'm going to see is correction. You say, how's that happen? Holy Ghost. He's real good at it. Doesn't matter what story you're trying to read, you're going to find something in there that links back to, hey, you need to take care of this. Ignoring it doesn't make it go away. You know what it does? It robs you of some other or some of the other spiritual blessings because God says we need to address it, and you say, no. I want dessert, but I don't want dinner. Not going to happen. God's not a 2024 parent where if you don't eat it for dinner, they'll throw it away and then order takeout so that you can have what you want. No, if you didn't eat it for dinner, you got to eat it for breakfast too. But there is no dessert if dinner's not gone. 
What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Same verse number 12. If you have not been faithful in that which is another's man, who shall give you that which is your own? You know what I see a lot of today, Brother Adrian, in the ministry? I see people that want something and they want God's approval on it. They don't want something from the Lord that they can do for Him. In truth, anything that God gave you, it's still His. God winks at our ignorance and He allows you to put your hands on it for a while. He allows you to possess it. But we know that at any moment He could take it from you. That's what Job said. The Lord giveth, He taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Why? Because it was all His before He gave it to me. It's still all His after He took it away. God's still God regardless of what I have in my pocketbook, or who I have around me, what I have in my family. He says, God has not changed regardless of what I own. He owned it all when He said, let there, and He made it all. Amen. Well, if you can't be entrusted to just be faithful in something that belongs to somebody else. You know what that means? You've got to do very little in the grand scheme of things. If you don't own it, you don't have to pay taxes on it. If you don't own it, you're not responsible for making sure that it's in running order. You're not responsible for making sure there's a place to put it, to keep it safe, to make sure that it's in peak operating condition. You just have to do what the master asked you to do. And that's all you have to be concerned with. Right? Being a servant is an easy thing. You don't have to make any decisions. Being a steward, that means that they've entrusted you to do something. Well, under Bible mentality, you can't have a steward unless you have demonstrated to the steward what is expected of him. A steward must be taught before he can be a steward. So by the fact that this guy is a steward, you know what that means? He knew what the master expected because the master showed him. And he went out and he did it a different way. And word got back to the master and he said, you're getting ready to lose your job, go get your business in order. It's time to open up the books and do some accounting. Figure out where we're at. Well... If you can't be faithful to just do what you've been shown that's all it is when it comes to being a steward it's emulation it's conforming to what it was the master wanted you to do well I don't know how to do that well he just showed you do it like he did it. well I'm not going to do as good of a job if he wanted it done that way every time he'd do it every time He's going to give you a space to get better at doing it. He showed you how to do it. He just wants you to be faithful to do it. You know what the thing about being faithful is? If you do it enough, you'll start to get good at it. It doesn't matter what it is. There's a lot to be said when it comes to hiring somebody that they show up every day and they try. They may not do it, but they try. You know what that tells me? One day they're going to do it. And one day they'll probably do it better than a lot of other people. Because they show up with the mindset that they're going to get something done that day. I can work with that. You know what I can't work with? Shows up and doesn't do nothing. Or shows up and does it the way that they want to do it. Shows up and does something that nobody in the building ever taught them to do or said was okay to do. That blows my mind. Right? It just doesn't compute with me. But we've got option A, B, and C. Well, let's go with X. Where'd that come from? That's what this unjust steward did. He came up with his own solution that the master had never taught him. And as a result of that, the master said, you're thinking, essentially what he said is, is you're thinking like a politician. He said, you're pretty, pretty quick. Thinking like a politician. So that hopefully you can go find a place to stay after I get rid of you. He says, that makes sense to the flesh. 
He says, but who's going to hire you after they have hear what it is that you've done? Well, the thing about being a steward is you don't have to worry about results. You know what you have to worry about? What the master entrusted you to do. Just be faithful. If the master comes along and he's not satisfied with what you're doing, he's going to show you how to correct it. He's going to say, hey, next time try it this way. All right. Show up and do it that way next time. But no news from the master means that you're doing everything to his expectations. I find that a lot of Christians have trouble with not getting a pat on the back every single day from God saying that you're doing exactly what I want you to do. Y'all understand that Elijah went 40 days and 40 nights on one meal that an angel, not even God, brought to him down underneath of a juniper tree? You know that in that 40 days and 40 nights, Elijah didn't hear from God? He just knew that there's a cave that he is headed to. When he got to the cave, he heard a whole lot, but God wasn't in it until what? A still small voice. But I wonder how many modern Christians could go 40 days and 40 nights just on a direction and a final stop. You know what Elijah said? God said, go that way, I'm going that way until I find God. If you can't be faithful enough to just do that, what makes you think you're going to hear the voice of God in the midst of every chaos and struggle and everything else going around in your life? If you're not faithful to listen to them when it's quiet, you're certainly not going to be faithful enough to listen to them when the world's coming apart. Just be faithful. I've said, faith may not be the most important thing, but it's still pretty important because without it you cannot please God. It's a part of the math problem no matter what you're trying to do for the Lord. If you want God to bless it, faith's got to be included in it. But verse number 13 says, No man can serve two masters. For you either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now's where he brings things full circle. He, before this, he's just explaining the point of the story. Now he's giving them the spiritual implication. He says, The unjust servant, he had two masters. You say, well, go back and read the story again. There was the Lord of the house, and then there was the steward. Yeah, and then the steward also had himself. He could either serve the master, or he could serve himself. He didn't care about other people and their financial situations. That's not why he gave them a deal on how much they owed to his master. No, he cared about himself. He was hedging his bets so that he could get another job. He was trying to make sure that he wasn't going to have to go out and beg for food because he had too much pride. That was his problem. If he wouldn't have had pride in the first place, he'd have been a just steward. But Jesus boils it all down to, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot be faithful in those things that the world considers important and still have the approval of God as a steward. Likewise, the world will despise you as they despise Christ if you cling to the things that the Master approves of. He says, there is no fence-sitting. There is no play on both sides. Either your soul is strong enough to cling to the Lord or your flesh is going to revert back to the things of the world and drag your soul with it. One's going to be stronger than the other. It's just up to you. Then verse number 14 is really what piqued my interest as I was studying. It says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous. We knew that, but Luke just, by the Holy Ghost said, just remind them, they're covetous. What are they covetous of? They're covetous of the crowd that Jesus has following them around. They're covetous of the attention that the people are giving to this guy who came out of the middle of nowhere in the backwoods, claims to be a carpenter, right? Shows up, 
He looks like a Jew, talks like a Jew, dresses like a Jew, but he's talking about things that Jews haven't said in a very long time. Right? He kind of sounds like that crazy dude out in the woods that we chopped his head off. His name was John the Baptist. He says, is this the one that John was talking about when he said that the one coming after him was greater? Well, the covetous. Also hypocrites and a generation of vipers, but we don't have time to get into that. It says, they heard all these things, and they derided them. Makes pretty good sense. Now, he's not just saying this. It's also talking about all the things in the stories and the parables that he's given before this. They hear all of that wisdom. It just makes common sense. And you know what they do? They start to deride them, tear them down. They start bickering among themselves on who could come up with a better illustration than what was just said. What are they doing? They're trying to sow discontent among the people. They really don't care what he's talking about. All they care about is that people are listening. That's what they cared about. Because they know if people listened to him, they would start following after him. And you know what that meant? They'd have been out of a job. So, verse number 15, He said unto them, the Pharisees, ye are, that, or ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abominable in the sight of God. As I read that, no doubt I knew long before right, that the Pharisees were ones that esteemed themselves in the eyes of men. Jesus elsewhere called them what whited sepulchers full of old men's bones, cisterns that could hold no water, clouds without rain. Right, They were empty. I knew that. I knew that they hated the Lord. Never given much thought to the latter parts of verse, verse number 15. And it says, For that which is highly esteemed among men is abominable in the sight of God. Do you ever realize the things that the world clings the most, that they seek after the most? Right? Those most fleshly and selfish and prideful of ambitions are the things that God hates the most. Pride has to be one of them. Well, why you say that? Because over in... Was it Pro See, the Proverbs of Ecclesiastes, I can't remember right now. I've been fighting a migraine all week and my brain's mush. But it says that there are seven things that God hates. One of them is a proud look. Pride's where it all started. You go back to the garden. Why did Eve partake of the fruit? Because she had the desire to become as God, knowing the difference between good and evil. That's what the serpent promised her. He said, you're not going to die. You're going to become more like God if you eat that fruit. It was her pride that she desired to be like God instead of being content as God's creation. Out of everything else that God created, God didn't walk in the cool of the day with anybody else but Adam and Eve. That wasn't enough. She wanted to be more like him, but all it resulted in was becoming the exact opposite of him. Sinful. Pride is what still causes wars and divisions and murmurings and backstabbing and bitterness and so many things in the Bible start with what? Because it's how I felt. And how I feel is more important than anything about you. So until I feel better, I'm going to do whatever I want to to take it out on you. That is the cycle that the world has gone through over and over and over again. Men have come up with what the world would say more wicked and more heinous things throughout the years. Now they've always had those ambitions. It's just that people couldn't pull it off before. It's a whole lot harder to exterminate an entire nation when you don't have weapons that can wipe entire countries off the face of the earth in an afternoon. Right? It's a whole lot harder for Herod to pull off the slaughter of the innocents when they don't have drones that can track where everybody's moving all the time from the sky. 
What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm just saying they had the same desires. They just didn't have the same capabilities. But I wonder nowadays, but it took an act of God back then. But how much more of an act of God would it take now for a woman to put her newborn babe in an ark made of reeds and float it down the river have it wash up in some bulrushes and just the right person come along and find it, choose to adopt him and raise her as his own, then hire his original mama as his wet nurse and then later his instructor so that she still got to raise him. How much harder would that be today if just so happened a drone flew over at the time you launched it and was able to follow it down the river? Right? It would take even more of an act of God today for the story of Moses to happen. Well, you're saying, brother, the things that God hates the most, for some reason, that's just what the world wants. But likewise, that's also true. You know what the world doesn't like? Somebody that's faithful. Why? Because it points them out as being unfaithful. It's real easy to call yourself faithful when everybody in the group is unfaithful and you say, well, I'm just as faithful as everybody else. That doesn't mean you're faithful. That just means that you're not any more of a slacker than the other slackers around you. Faithful is not a metric, right, a scale. You're not faithful over here if you do this and then faithful over there if you do that. No, you're either faithful both places or you're not faithful at either one. Right, we understand that. If you break it down that way, the world will say that they understand that. Until what? Until somebody faithful shows up and shows how unfaithful everybody else is truly being. You ever notice that the world says that they want people that are invested until they get invested and care too much? Until they start asking the wrong questions? The world doesn't want people that are invested. They want dumb people that follow them around without asking questions. They want them to be loyal without being committed. They want bandwagon fans. Well, you know what the problem with bandwagon fans is? They don't last. They're going to jump ship eventually. But the world's okay with that because as long as people don't ask too many questions, their secrets aren't going to get found out. The world doesn't want committed people. They want people that are committed to staying dumb. You ever notice how God teaches us to be sober and to be vigilant? You know why the world wants people that are intoxicated and they're lazy? Because you can pull a whole lot of stuff when people are out of their right mind and when they're not paying attention. Everything that the Lord encourages us to be. I, I encourage you to study it out. But we're supposed to be wise. The world doesn't want wise. The world wants gullible. And we're supposed to be harmless as doves. Well, the world wants people that are armed to the teeth and ready to go off at the slightest infraction. But people think, oh, I wish we still lived in the wild west. No, you don't. You want to live in a world where if you accidentally bumped into somebody that you didn't see because they were standing behind you, that you've got to go have a duel out in the middle of the street? Doesn't sound like a place I want to live. I'm a good shot, but I'm not 100% accurate, and I like to take my time. Right? I'm not a quick draw guy. That's how people end up shooting themselves in the foot on accident. Don't sign me up for that club. The Bible encourages us to be meek. Doesn't say to be welcome at, but it does say to be meek. We shouldn't desire to go out and start conflict with others. Christ didn't come seeking to bring conflict to where you were. Why should we be any different? You know what the world wants? People that are digging and prying and finding ways to irritate, to prov they're looking for provocateurs. Because if people are angry at each other, they can't be angry at somebody that's pulling the strings. If the devil can get you so focused on your neighbor that you can't see what he's doing, he's accomplished his job. Is it in the Bible, but it's true. 
right? The greatest deception in all of mankind is trying to convince the world that the devil doesn't exist. Because the moment that he became successful in it, people weren't looking for him. The moment that he was able to take the things that appeared to be or appeared to be belonging unto God and he was able to take ownership of them, then he had a disguise that people chose not to see through. The world wants people that are so focused on themselves and others, making it a contest between people, so that they don't have enough free time to sit down and realize that everything that they've done throughout their entire life doesn't bring them any satisfaction. You know why there were crowds of people that followed Christ wherever He went? Because they knew that they needed what He had in some respect. Nowadays, you could drop an elephant out of a cargo plane and half the people wouldn't notice because they're too busy staring at the phone. Well, how, do you, how can you say that, Brother Because they can't see when the light turns red when they're texting and trying to drive at the same time. Right? There are certain things that have people's attention so much that they can't pull their eyes away from it. For some of them, it's their 401k balance. I had a boss one time that, like literally, it, every day it was either ulcers or he was over the moon based off of whatever the stock market did. I'm like, you know it's going to do that either way. Right? Why do you have to check it every second of every single day? Because if it does go bad or if it does go good, you're not going to focus on what we're doing the rest of the day because you want to either tell people about how bad it went or how good it went overnight. So focused on A that they can't see anything else. That's where the devil wants people to be. Because if you take a step back, you realize that everybody's got the same stuff you got and none of them are satisfied with it either. The reason that Christ had crowds is because people knew that they were missing something. That's our commentary against the society of their time. I'm saying society at that time, if you wanted to be invested in everything that was going on, you could have been. Martha had Christ in her house teaching spiritual knowledge that she wasn't going to hear anywhere else, and yet she was still more worried about putting on a spread. Christ rebuked her and praised Mary. Why? Because she had chosen to tend to things that had real worth. Martha couldn't see the value in sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing what Jesus said. Right? I'm not condemning her for it. I'm just saying people do it all the time. Don't be surprised. It's been happening whether there's mega cities and lights and everything else going on 24-7. Back then they actually had a night time. And can you imagine this? You could actually see stars in the skies. Amen. There were people that could look up and see that there's a whole lot more out there than we can wrap our mind around. They've been trying to do it ever since and they still haven't come up with even a name for all the things that they found. They give them letters and numbers and call it whatever that combination of things was. But I read where God knows them all by name. When you've got time to sit down and think about stuff like that, you realize how small you are, that you're in need of something else. That's where the Bible says that nature, even those, cries out for the return of the Creator. They can't even be saved. Rocks and plants and insects and all manner of animals. Why? Because they remember what it was like when God was in control of everything. It cries out for a return of the old ways. Because everything was better under Him. You give people enough time to think one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to go crazy, okay, which that happens a lot. But that's when they refuse to see logic and they go further and further down the rabbit hole itself. 
But if you give people enough time to think, they may just come to the realization that they have a need. Some people, you don't have to tell them. They know that they're needy. You know who those were? They were the publicans and the sinners that Jesus was rebuked for hanging around. They were the ones that when they saw him, they knew that they needed him. They said he's the friend of the downtrodden, the outcast, the lowest of society. And he said, yeah. And if you had been their friend, they may not have ended up as the outcast of society. Instead of looking down your nose at them, if you would have given them what they needed instead of what you wanted to give them, maybe they'd have had a different life. But you don't have to convince those that know they have a need that they're in need of something. They saw Christ and they desired Him. Those people that had enough time to sit around and think and realize the things that He says, I need. They're the ones that left everything that they had and went after Him. The ones that sat and had heard and made a plan that if one day Jesus ever comes by our way, we're going to take our friend that's been lame and we're going to take up his bed and we're going to take him to wherever Christ is and regardless of what the situation, we're going to get him to Jesus. You think that just happened at the spur of the moment? I'm convinced that they had a plan. I'm convinced that blind Bartimaeus had been practicing a shouting voice for a little bit. Just in case. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. I'm sure he rehearsed it, make sure he didn't stumble his way through it. He said, what? He knew he had a need, so he was prepared for the day in case that need could be met. When people had enough time, they not only realized that they had a need, they'd come, with it, come up with a plan, whether it would work or not, they'd come up with a plan to have the need solved. I've seen a lot of people come into churches with the plan only for God to ruin it and do what God was going to do. But the point, they knew they needed something and they would seek it out. You know why they don't have a need today? Because there's nobody with a light bright enough to reach past all the things in front of them. There's nobody that's been faithful enough in little so that God can entrust them with a lot. There's a few. Right, Jesus turned the world upside down with 12 and one of them was of the devil. It only takes a few. But imagine if there was a whole lot more. Imagine if everyone in the church was on fire for God. What could God do? Not in our community. I'm talking about around the whole world. He did it back then. He could still do it today. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.